Uh, thank you very much, Gabriel, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm using the amplification because I have the kind of voice, I don't know why, that disappears in a large room. So this is so that you can actually hear what I'm saying. Now, I usually talk about uh, the neural decoding work and specifically about this work that we're doing on how to build a common model of neural representational spaces for decoding. But because I'm preceding, that my, my talk now is preceding um, a debate with Nancy Canwisher, uh, I was, I'm, I'm going to give my um, another talk, a different talk, about uh, views about uh, how things like faces, bodies, objects are represent ventral temporal cortex. And um, I just have to show people in my lab at the beginning to make sure that I acknowledge that the work that I'm talking about really is, uh, is their work. So this is the outline of what I'd like to talk about. First, I'd like to talk about um, how we, we think about, how most people think about how ventral temporal cortex, the ventral visual pathway is organized and with a special emphasis on how it seems to be optimized for person perception, and especially face and body perception. Um, and some of the, I'll just go through some of the, the, the uh, compelling evidence for the, the uh, primacy of uh, person perception, face perception, body perception in ventral, the ventral visual pathway. Um, but then I'm gonna talk about how there are some problems with this conventional, or, um, um, uh, these models. And I call it a fly in the ointment. And specifically, I'm going to talk about how there's a stimulus sampling bias. Um, and that primarily uh, concerns that we, the studies that have been done use still images of a limited variety of, 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 of stimuli. And how that really has had an impact on how we can understand the ventral visual pathway. And then about computational methods. So I'll get a little bit into uh, the role of decoding for thinking uh, about ventral uh, visual pathway in a new way. So first, what is the evidence that it's optimized for face perception? Well, there's something very special about faces. There's no, absolutely no doubt about it. Um, for example, uh, in psychophysical studies in which people move their, fi their eyes to images of faces and natural images, so they have two natural images, one on each side, the task is just to move to the side that has a face in it. People are blazingly fast. Uh, there are reliably accurate saccades as fast as 100 to 110 milliseconds. Um, this is faster than it should be, given what we know about uh, evoked potentials in the brain to faces. Um, the uh, uh, single cells in the vent in, in, in monkey IT cortex that are face selective, so they're face neurons, this is the red bar, have a much faster average latency than the neurons that are selective for body parts or objects or places. And um, even, uh, and the detection of familiar faces uh, is also, uh, allows a saccade to a familiar face as compared to an unfamiliar face with reliable accuracy as fast as 180 milliseconds. Again, this is just too fast. The first evoked potential that uh, shows a distinction that is sensitive, is modulated by familiarity, is at 210 milliseconds. And so, so somehow this information has to be, uh, get, uh, be realized in a, a movement, an eye movement, 30 milliseconds before evoked potentials can detect that kind of information. So there's something that's, the, the system seems to be really optimized for face perception. Um, it seems to be pretty resistant to attention. So this is an MEG study that we did where we had people looking at these superimposed faces on houses and they would attend either to the face or the house. And um, when they uh, were attending to, uh, uh, and then th this shows the sort of the average evoked uh, field uh, while people are looking at these images and performing this task. Uh, when they are attending to faces and houses, uh, face attention is the per, uh, this per, uh, magenta line, house attention is the light blue line. They are perfectly superimposed. It's absolutely insensitive to the direction of the, the type of attention task until 190 milliseconds. And this, what is be, and this uh, response is the response to the face. So even when they're attending to the house, okay, 
And really, if you, if you perform this task, the, the face subjectively disappears because it's a de demanding task. That first response in the brain, which is the uh, equivalent of the N170, is, is, is there in full force. So it's quite automatic. Um, when people are unaware that they're looking at a face, so the, in, in these experiments by uh, Shang He uh, and, his and his collaborators, they uh, render uh, the face invisible using continuous flash suppression. So the two eyes are seeing different stimuli. The face is shown to one eye. The other eye is seeing this uh, uh, very dynamic stimulus. When that happens, they don't know the face is there. And at some point, the face image breaks through suppression. And so this, uh, uh, the breakthrough from interocular suppression is used as an index of processing that's happened without awareness. And faces, if they're upright, break through substantially faster than faces if they're inverted. So again, people, if, if people are unaware of the faces, something about the upright face is grabbing the system uh, before the subject's even aware that the face, that their face is uh, uh, being presented to them. And this is, again, is seen for um, features like the, uh, the direction of the face. If the face is facing towards you, it breaks through faster than if it's turned to the side. If the face is a friend, it breaks through faster than if the face is a stranger. So it's not just is the face is an upright image, it's what direction is the head directed? Is it head directed towards you or away? Is it someone you know or is it someone you don't know? That kind of information is being processed. And there is a specialized system in the brain for face processing, consisting of multiple areas. So uh, the, the first three areas that uh, we, we talked about were the fusiform face area, the occipital face area, and the superior temporal sulcus. We have a model for how these systems uh, are, play a role in um, visual analysis. Uh, more recent work has suggested there are additional face areas in anterior ter superior temporal sulcus, uh, anterior ventral temporal cortex, and even in frontal cortex. But these areas all respond more strongly to phases than any other stimulus. And there are equivalent patches, a system of patches, in the monkey brain that also respond more strongly to phases than any other stimulus. So this is uh, a, 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 a deep body of evidence from psychophysical studies of the speed of processing, the attention, uh, the, uh, the fact that phases are processed with minimal attention, even without awareness, and there's this special system in the brain for processing faces, and primarily in ventral temporal cortex or in the, in the ventral visual pathway. All of this suggests that uh, the system, uh, that this is a, a, a very dominant function in ventral temporal cortex. Face processing fast requires minimal attention, mediated by a distributed neural system, humans and monkeys. But I want to say that I think there's a fly in the ointment. And after the talk, you should decide whether you think it's a little house fly or something more serious. <laughs> so for the first uh, uh, problem that I want to talk about is the stimulus sampling bias. That uh, almost all studies use still images of faces and objects with a very limited range of categories. Faces, bodies, um, some animals, limited range of animals and, and a certain categories of objects. And very, very few studies have used dynamic images and looked at the, the information content in um, actions. So uh, uh, the conclusion that I'm going to come, up, come to is that uh, there's a dominant role is being played by the representation of agentic action in ventral temporal cortex. The second problem is the inadequate uh, computational methods for data analysis and modeling. And these have relied on univariate contrasts. You know, is there a stronger response to one thing than another? And it asks what I think is the wrong question, which is what is the function of an area? And um, there are two problems with this. First of all, it's the function. You know, it, it does, do these areas do one thing? Or there are many functions that are multiplexed into an area. 
And the second problem is, is it an area? Or is there a different way to understand how uh, uh, cortical topography rather than, uh, other than a division into these uh, category selective areas? And I will argue that uh, we can uh, uh, make more progress by modeling functional architecture as a high dimensional representational space. And that will better capture, capture this complexity as well as the category spe specific regions. So let's first talk about um, the stimulus sampling bias. Now, I just have to find out this group of young people here. How many of you have not have seen, how many of you have not seen these stimuli before? Oh, look at that! Well, these uh, uh, have been these were developed in the 1940s, I believe, uh, and they were uh, produced by drawing triangles on index cards and making a movie. And I think you can tell there's a difference between the, what's going on here between these two triangles and here with these two triangles. So something is going on here. Let's just do it again, okay? That suggests there's an interaction between these, these two triangles. There's no biological form here. All there is is action. Um, but people very quickly see that these two triangles are having some kind of a fight. And there's a, there's a big a big triangle who's you know beating up on a, a little triangle. Well, these were used in a um, uh, uh, functional brain imaging study back in 2000. Castelli was the first author. It was from Chris Frist's lab, and it was to look at the representation of um, uh, theory of mind, social knowledge. And people concentrated on this area in medial prefrontal cortex and this area in the superior temporal sulcus, uh, posterior superior temporal sulcus or temporal parietal junction. But there was this area too. This really is right there in the lateral fusiform gyrus, suspiciously close to where we think the fusiform face area is. Now, uh, Gobini et al. Uh, did a, a study using the same stimuli with some other stimulus and repeated the uh, activation of the superior temporal sulcus and um, a little bit more here, some things in the medial prefrontal cortex, but also, again, ventral temporal cortex and the fusiform cortex. And they also showed that these, these displays, these are point light displays of biological motion. Again, there is no form here that's obvious from the still images. I can get that. You can see the still image doesn't, it doesn't obviously suggest a human form. But as soon as it starts moving, you can see someone doing handsprings, right? And when people look at these uh, point light displays of motion, it activates the lateral fusiform gyrus. So there's no biological form here. There, is no fa there are no faces, there are no bodies. All there is is motion and information, information car carried by motion. And for some reason, ventral temporal cortex is uh, responsive to that. Now, this is a study from uh, Greg McCarthy. And um, they had people looking at videos of industrial robots doing their thing. And these robots did very, had did, uh, tasks of varying complexity with, that were uh, either uh, of varying levels of goal directedness. And they found that the more complex goal-directed tasks evoke stronger activity in ventral temporal cortex, again, in the fusiform gyrus. Or compound this, angles. This is not one of their videos. And twist parts into place, the web. similar to the flexibility offered by a manual way. operator. You can, you know, you to learn more about the FANUC M3IA and our something. full line of assembly uh, and delta style robots, pull or compound angles, so seeing a non and twist parts into place, clearly, no one would say similar to the flexibility offered uh, by a manual a operator. To learn more about the FANUC M3IA. Now, this is a study from my lab. This is Sam Nastase. Um, who was a student of mine in Italy, and now he's a graduate student at Dartmouth. Here he is back in his Italian days having an espresso on Corso Rosmini in Rovereto. Well, he had subjects looking at videos of animals, and the subject would indicate whether or not the uh, 
class of, of animal, like insects or primates or lizards, was the same as the previous one, or whether what, what they were doing was the same as the previous one. So this is a study of attention. I'm not going to talk about the effect of attention. I'm going to talk about something else that came out of this that was very surprising. So just to use a flavor for what these videos look like, here's a video of ants running, a seagull running, and a baboon running. So these animals are all doing the same thing. The motion vectors are very different, and the visual form of the animals are very different. But they're doing the same thing. Trying to get from one place to another. So here's a gorilla eating some kind of fruit, hummingbird sipping nectar, and a caterpillar eating something disgusting. And, um, again, very different animals, very different kinds of eating behaviors, but it has the same goal. Or you can group things by, um, uh, by species. So here are insects. Here's a beetle, a caterpillar, an ant, and a uh, ladybug fighting, eating, running. So he analyzed this using what was called representational similarity analysis, which looks at the, um, the vector of, of the response to each uh, condition and how similar it is to the, vectors, the, the pattern vectors for other conditions. And then he tries to analyze that matrix of pairwise similarities for 20 different um, conditions, uh, four actions by five types of animal. And he, he did it with two models. One says, well, let's, to what extent are animals um, of the same category uh, similar to each other in terms of the responses? The second one here is to what extent are the actions the similar to each other, the responses to the action similar to each other, regardless of which animal is performing the action. Okay? And what was surprising in this, it's a complicated study. It's on BioArchive, by the way. It hasn't been accepted yet. Um, and you can see it on BioArchive, uh, is that the, uh, this similarity structure, showing the similarity of, of the action, Response, similar responses to the same actions, regardless of animal, accounted for a lot more variance than the similarity of the animal species, which we found very surprising. Now, it's not that surprising in places like the intraparietal sulcus or precentral sulcus, where we thought there might be action representations. But it's also true in lateral occipital and ventral temporal cortex. Look at that. So about over three times more variance accounted for by the similarity of actions than by the similarity of taxonomy, ta taxonomic similarities. And then another piece of information here comes from some work that's coming out of Dave Leopold's laboratory at NIH. And this is a work with Brian Russ where they did MRI studies in monkeys. And they had the monkeys looking at natural movies of monkeys interacting and other thing, things happening. And the monkeys are very happy to watch these movies. But apparently they get bored after seeing them two or three times. So you have to give them special incentive to watch the movies again. Um, and they ask, can we use the responses to the movie to identify the face patches in the monkey cortex? So they would uh, tag the movie for when faces were on the in the movie and, and as compared to times when faces were not in the movie. And they found out it was a very effective localizer for the full face patch system in the monkey cortex. So this uh, responses to a natural movie does reflect this face patch system, which was mapped out using still images. But then they just looked at the motion energy in the, uh, in the movie and asked, to what extent does the motion energy, regardless of what it's representing, uh, drive the responses? How much variance is accounted for by motion energy? in the variation response in different parts of the brain. And it was a much stronger effect. Motion energy really dominated the response across um, you know, in, in visual to anterior temporal cortex and frontal cortex here. So what about in the face areas? Are these face areas still mostly sensitive to moving, to the, to, to the input, uh, presence of faces? Well, this is what really surprised them. And I think this is really important. First of all, they show that the face response which is what is driving this map here, 
okay? Accounts for three to five percent of the variance in most of these phase factors. These are all six of the phase factors, PL, ML, MF, AL, AF, and AM, up to a maximum of five percent in AF, okay? And in every single case, the motion energy accounts for more variance than the, um, than the presence of phases. And this isn't just any motion energy. They found that uh, if the, uh, uh, the dynamic information was in videos with um, animals in them, it, it was a dominant feature. If the dynamic information was in videos without animals, just natural things like hurricanes, it accounted for much less variance. So it seems to be something specific to animal action that's driving the responses in these uh, monkey uh, IT neurons, including in the face neurons, okay? More so than the presence of faces. And there's a really nice talk. He, uh, David Leopold gave a, a colloquium at Dartmouth uh, in May, and the video of that is um, on the um, CCN website for Dartmouth. So you can look this up and watch the talk. And in this, he's talking about work that I don't think is published yet, where they're measuring single cell responses in face patches while they watch these movies. And again, finding that uh, the, once the, uh, uh, they look at the response to movies as compared to the response to still images, that the, uh, the response uh, tuning functions become much more complicated. As a matter of fact, they're kind of baffled by exactly what these things mean at this point. But they find that the, if they measure a population of neurons right in the middle of a face patch, like AF or AM, that uh, they, uh, it's best to describe the, uh, the variety of tuning functions as a high dimensional space. And they, when they do a PCA, it takes about 40 or 50 PCs. One more piece of information from uh, Fairhall and Gobini by another paper under review. They had blind subjects listening to the voices of people. So these are people who have never seen a face, never seen an animal form. And in these subjects, you could decode information from the voice uh, about the, the emotional content of the, of the voice in the blind subjects, but not so well in the sighted subjects. So this cortex if it has not ever been uh, stimulated with visual input, is coding something else that seems to be emphasizing people, so the emotional content of voices. Uh, the point I've been making here is that lateral fusiform gyrus uh, activity is evoked or modulated by things that have no biological form, moving triangles, moving points of light, industrial robots. Uh, it's modulated more by animal behavior than by animal form. This is surprising because animal behavior doesn't evoke a stronger response in ventral temporal cortex. The point is the pattern of response is more dependent on the type of, ac of action or behavior the animal is uh, performing, and voices are congenitally blind. So the sin of sampling bias that still images the faces, bodies, and objects is restricted or understanding of the functional architecture of ventral temporal cortex. So um, what is represented in the lateral fusion cortex? What, what's, what, are, what's, what are the dominant features? Is it animate as compared to inanimate ent entities, or is it agency? So is the animate, inanimate distinction a major large-scale feature? Now this also has a long history uh, in the decoding literature, where we find that the responses to animate things like faces and cats are uh, distant from, quite dissimilar from the responses to uh, small objects and houses. Um, in a beautiful study by Chiani, looking at uh, population responses uh, in monkey IT cortex to a wide variety of images, they did a, um, a similar structure analysis back in 2007, and they found the biggest distinction was between the responses to animate stimuli as compared to inanimate stimuli. And this was repeated using the same uh, subset of these images by Nico Krikus Corta, who found that the similarity structure in um, monkey IT cortex, showing the distinction between faces and bodies and animate and inanimate, was mirrored in human IT cortex, suggesting that there's a high degree of similarity in the representational spaces in monkeys and, um, and humans. 
And uh, Colony Grill Specter has uh, proposed in her um, paper on uh, uh, ventral temporal cortex that one of the major distinctions is between animate and inanimate uh, uh, fields. And then there's a structure that's kind of multiplexed below that uh, for different uh, aspects of animate stimuli. So the problem with this is that in all these studies that, that look at are the stimuli animate or inanimate, they've usually used human, mammalian, or avian stimuli. And when we do a broader sampling of animate stimuli, clearly animate stimuli, we get results that suggest the distinction doesn't apply to all animate stimuli. So we did this study in 2012, Andy Connolly did the study, where he had people looking at pictures of ladybugs and luna moths in addition to mallards, warblers, um, uh, monkeys, and uh, lemurs. And so when he looked at the distinction between the response strength to primates and bugs, it looked just the same as the map contrasting faces to objects. So this is uh, a, a, a pattern that we see repeatedly with the animate stimuli on the side and the inanimate stimuli on this side, but now we have animate stimuli on the side and bugs on this side. Now it could be that if we had people looking at objects in the same study, it would be just an str even stronger response in, uh, in this more medial cortex. So we did that study. Long Sha was the first author in this paper, where we had uh, some bona fide inanimate objects, keys and hammers, in addition to uh, things that uh, were kind of at the low end of this animacy continuum. So we had stingrays and ladybugs and clownfish and lobsters, in addition to people, chimpanzees, uh, cats, birds, pelicans, warblers, and giraffes. And what we found was that in ventral temporal cortex, the uh, uh, similarity between responses or the, um, was uh, on this continuum in the similarity analysis that hammers and keys were overlapping with the low animacy stimuli. You see, what we would have expected is that the, uh, the uh, inanimate objects would be way over here, and then all the animate would be over here with animacy continuum from low animacy to high animacy. We're calling it the animacy continuum, but we really don't know what it is. All we know is that people are, and, and mammals are on one end, and bugs and fish are on the other. This continuum, again, has a, uh, a topography that shows this lateral to medial uh, distinction. So the animate inanimate dichotomy does not survive broadening the stimulus sampling to low animacy animals. So no one would say that stingrays and ladybugs and luna moths are inanimate. Um, and this uh, animacy continuum actually is an old idea in intellectual history going back at least to Aristotle and his treatise called, treatise called uh, On the Soul. Um, there are also animacy hierarchies in linguistics. So the grammatical form, forms are sometimes um, uh, conditioned by how animate the thing is that you're talking about. We have a little bit of that in English where we, can, we never use it when we refer to a human. Sometimes, some people will refer to babies as its. I don't. Uh, but, we, we, but people don't have any trouble referring to insects as it, right? We very use, rarely use a, a gendered pronoun for, pro, uh, uh, for insects. And it have, this plays an even stronger role in other languages. So is this it? Is it the animacy continuum? So varying levels of agentic complexity, is that the dominant organizing principle in ventral temporal cortex? I'm going to skip over this just to, uh, and not exactly. I'm going to, so I'm going to uh, now uh, uh, indulge in a digression to reframe the question. And this is a, a very brief presentation of the methods we're developing for modeling high dimensional representational spaces based on a set of basis functions. These are basis functions have tuning profiles, connectivity profiles, and topographic components that are shared across brains. 
and this early work where we just did this in ventral temporal cortex. So we have people watching a complex movie, not too complex, it's from Hollywood, it's uh, <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark, and we measure their brain activity while they watch the movie. This is a very easy study to find subjects for because they're very happy to watch a movie and be paid. Um, now these uh, patterns of activity here are responses in two subjects' brains to the same time point in the movie. Now we reason that while people watch the movie, they're representing the same visual information. And because with a, a director like uh, Steven Spielberg, they're probably attending to the same kind of information. So somehow this pattern here, these patterns here, and these patterns here are representing the same visual information, but it's very hard to see exactly how they're similar. So we, the way we think about this is that each pattern of response can be thought of as a vector in a high dimensional space. Now I'm just showing this as a vector in a three dimensional space, three voxel space, but each voxel, each measurement unit in the pattern is a dimension in these pattern vectors. So as the movie progresses, the vector, the location of the vector, or the pattern vector, changes in this representational space. So this is just illustrative data showing 15 patterns for 15 time points in the movie with 15 response vectors in the three-dimensional representational spaces, three voxel representational spaces in two subjects' brains. And as you can see, because these uh, voxels are not well aligned anatomically, at least at this fine scale, the vectors are in quite different locations. Now the idea behind hyperalignment is that we want to find a transformation matrix here, such that when we transform this pattern of vectors, it becomes more similar to the first subject. And this is simply a, uh, a, a rotation, it's an improper rotation, that we, cal and we calculate it using the Procrustes transformation. And when we do that, we find a matrix that rotates this so that these two patterns of vectors are now in good alignment. And so now, the vectors for these different uh, time points in the movie are close to each other, making them more um, discriminable with simple classifiers. For a third subject, we have to find a another subject-specific transformation matrix to align this subject to the average of these two subjects. And again, the Procrustes transformation does a very good job of that. And this works actually remarkably well. So um, we find that uh, we, uh, when we do that, we derive a, a, a space for ventral temporal cortex that has as many dimensions as there are voxels, which is about a thousand. It, we can reduce that with PCA, and we find that with a, with, we, we need over 30 dimensions to account for this the information of this representational space in terms of the responses to the movie. Now, this is a measure of classification accuracy for classifying what part of the movie was the subject watching when we measured their brain activity. And you can see with five PCs, five, dimension, five dimensional space, five features, we're at about 47%. And it goes up, and in, in the ventral temporal cortex, it peaks up around 68, 69%. We're getting pretty close to around 30 or so. So somewhere above 30, we toyed with the idea of proposing that the magic number was 42, mm -hmm. but we abandoned that. So these 30 um, uh, PCs can be visualized in terms of the weights in the transformation matrix uh, in ventral temporal cortex, and these are the uh, dis distribution of weights in two subjects. And you can see they're not exactly the same for each PC, but there's some similar similarity that you can see with your human pattern recognizer here. Now the surprising thing is that none of these PCs really seems to be pulling out the location of the fusiform face area or the parahippocampal place area. So if we map out the fusiform face area in each subject using a standard localizer, we can, we, we, uh, can show the location of that using these yellow lines, and the green line is the parahippocampal place area. So does that mean that this uh, transformation and, and dimensionality reduction has essentially eliminated the existence of the, the fusiform face area? Is it plain? Uh, but that's not true at all, because it can be reproduced as a linear discriminant of these uh, uh, 
features, these PCs. And if you find the right set of weights, it's the same set of weights for all subjects, you can then model, uh, you can then find uh, the pattern that uh, best discriminates the response to faces from the response to objects. And now you can see that it's actually capturing the location of the fusiform face area very well. And here it is blown up. So you can see that this subject and this subject have very distinctive topographies of the fusiform face area, but they are captured in the model um, uh, that was derived from uh, responses to the movie. So the fusiform face area exists. The distinction between you know, uh, faces or faces and bodies and animals is in this model space, 35 dimensional model space. Um, how big a factor is it? How much variance does that linear discriminant account for? In terms of the responses to the movie, the dynamic you know, uh, content stories in, in a movie, not to still images, well, when we look at that linear discriminant, it accounts for about 7% of the variance, which is a third of the variance accounted for by the first dimension. And it's um, less than one eighth, it's about one eighth of the variance accounted for by the full 35 PC model. So something about what the brain is uh, representing in a natural viewing uh, condition like watching a, a dynamic movie, uh, this particular dimension is playing a relatively minor role. It exists, it, ex it, it exists, it's, it's very clear, but there's something else that is driving the uh, variability of patterns of response in ventral temporal cortex. Now if you go back to still images, and uh, this is the, from uh, the study, uh, Long Sha study, um, which used still images. That first dimension in a, a, a PCA accounts for over 50% of the variance. So with responses to still images, that, that dimension, which here is now the animacy continuum rather than the face object or um, animate inanimate distinction, but these, these things are all quite collinear in the uh, 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 ventral temporal cortex is accounting for a lot of variance, and the second PC is down around 10% of the variance. So does that mean that all the information in response to still images is captured by um, this uh, one dimension, this one contrast, animate versus animate, or animacy continuum, or faces versus objects, whatever you want to call it. And that really isn't true, so that first PC does a very good job of classifying between classes. So that is birds versus primates, or birds versus fish, or objects versus uh, insects. And the other, um, but the uh, uh, distinctions within class, pelicans versus uh, warblers, or people versus chimpanzees, um, are very poorly, uh, are, are much more poorly classified by the, the first PC only. And the uh, other PCs, the second to the 11th PC in this model, uh, th that affords good within class uh, discrimination. So that information about what is the difference in the response between the response to a warbler versus a pelican, or a stingray versus a clownfish, that information is hidden in these PCs that are accounting for much less variance in the responses to still images. But they still are carrying significant information over and above what is carried by that first um, dominant dimension. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up now. This takes me a little time. So is the animacy continuum uh, the dominant organizing principle for representation in ventral temporal cortex? Not exactly. So the animacy continuum, face object distinctions, account for only a small portion of variance in the responses to a rich dynamic stimulus. So the animacy continuum and face object distinctions count, account for only, only for coarse, but not the fine-grained distinctions. Um, and these dimensions are derived from responses to still images. Dimensions respond on, uh, based on responses to agentic behavior 
may tell a different story. In other words, the, uh, the representation of agentic behavior may be a much more dominant, uh, uh, play a much more dominant role in the representational space and ventral temporal cortex. So first I talked about a stimulus sampling bias. So these are images from um, uh, uh, Ruzbek Kiani's study had over a thousand such images, but they're all still images that are flashed to the animal. And when we look at studies that use things like the hydrosimal animations, uh, industrial robots, or these wonderful nature movies from David Attenborough, uh, we find that uh, the models based on these still images uh, don't seem to account for as much of what's going on in ventral temporal cortex. So category selective regions have more complex tuning functions that suggest they play more diverse roles in person perception. And representational geometry is dominated by the rep representation of behavior, not form. This is really a very surprising result that requires more studies to, to nail down. And the animate inanimate distinction is not the principal dimension that characterizes the coarse lateral to medial topography and ventral temporal cortex. So the second, the second one is inadequate computational methods. So uh, cognitive neuroscience has its roots, historical roots, in um, neuropsychology. And in neuropsychology, we could, uh, the, the method was to find patients who had uh, local brain damage due to some accident of nature and determine whether or not some functions were uh, impaired and others preserved. And the, the critical test was double dissociation. So finding that in one area, function A is impaired and B is, uh, is uh, preserved, and in another area, function A is preserved and function B is impaired. This is the standard um, method. And it was necessary because all that people could do is find patients, study them, and then wait for them to die to see where those brain lesions were. But we have much more sophisticated methods now. Um, and uh, so, uh, but with functional imaging, we've been, you know, uh, this again is historical. Uh, functional imaging started with positron emission tomography, looking at uh, changes in regional cerebral blood flow with positron emission tomography. I did that stuff, and um, we could get at most 10 measurements. So instead of having a thousand time points, we had ten, and um, so we, we had very limited uh, data. And the best we could do again is this kind of uh, looking for simple contrast, which conditions evoke stronger responses than other conditions. We have much better data and much better computational methods now. So looking at univariate contrast is really a holdover from the history of cognitive neuroscience in behavioral neurology and neuropsychology and early methods of functional brain imaging. And um, it, the, the reliance on simple contrasts, which are really like single dimensions in a representational space, reminds me of the, um, uh, the legend of the blind men and the elephant, where six blind men are sitting by a river and they sense the presence of something large among them. They go over to investigate. They can't see the thing, so they each feel different parts. One feels the tusk and says it's a spear. One feels the, um, the trunk and says it's, I don't know, a hose or something. One feels the, 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 the side and says it's a wall. One feels the tail and says it's a, a rope. One feels the uh, ear and says it's a fan. All those things are really correct, okay? The, the, you know, the tusk is kind of like a spear, and the ear is something like a fan, the tail is something like a rope. So there's nothing incorrect about what they're observing. But because they can't see the totality of the elephant, they can't say, it's an elephant. These are all just pieces of an elephant. And in, in many ways, the hypotheses about what is the V principle, what is the function of a, an area in ventral temporal cortex is, um, is like looking at a piece of a larger picture. Is it category selective regions? Some people have proposed stimulus size as a major dimension, expertise. Uh, we have the animacy continuum, domain specificity, even retinotopy. 
But to see the whole elephant, to see what is, you know, how is ventral temporal cortex doing the amazing thing that it does, which is it is the seat for complex vision, for recognizing what things are out there, you know, uh, and with all the variety and, 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 and subtlety of, of distinctions of what uh, we can encounter visually, we need better analytic computational methods. And that's why I propose that things like uh, neural decoding and uh, thinking of the ventral temporal cortex as a high dimensional representational space rather than as dominated by single, simple single dimensions is much more powerful. So the univariate statistics, which really goes back to neuropsychology and early um, functional imaging, is limiting analysis to univariate contrast. And this leads to at search for the function of an area. Uh, and that it's become circular, because if, you're, if, if this is your method of uh, study, what happens is you think the brain is divided into areas that have single functions. But in contrast, if you use multivariate methods like pattern classification, representational similarity analysis, hyperalignment, you can model the functional architecture of an area as a high dimensional representational space. So this can account for these category selective regions. They don't disappear, they're very real. But also accounts for fine grained patterns that carry finer distinctions. And it, it can allow us to have models of functional topography that are multiplexed uh, topographies where the, uh, the, the tuning function uh, of, of a single unit, that could be a neuron or a voxel, um, is complex and it is not easily described as being responsive to one thing and nothing else. So with that, I thought this would be a good introduction to the debate. <laughs>